Historic Warwick Castle that lies in the heart of the English Midlands has proudly dominated the Warwickshire skyline for over a thousand years and is classed as the finest medieval fortification of its kind in Great Britain. Part of this castle's glorious history was restaged, employing over 3,000 extras to recreate its epic siege of 1642. So what you're about to experience is a film record of that powerful and spectacular occasion. From the years 1625 to 1649, Charles I was on the English throne. He was a monarch who believed in the divine right of kings. It was this belief that changed the role of monarchy and was to lead England into civil war. In the summer of 1642, the long drawn out quarrel between the king and parliament degenerated into open hostility and each side began to gather its armies from amongst the population of England and Wales. The country was divided in two, brother fought brother, father fought son, in a war that was waged with cannon, pike, sword and musket. A war that was to last for seven long years. Give fire! After the king had raised the royal standard at Nottingham, the first major clash of arms was to be under the shadow of Edge Hill in the county of Warwick. Two months earlier, in 1642, part of this gathering royalist army marched on Warwick Castle and faced it under siege. Warwick Castle lies at the center of England. The strategic importance of this position was recognized from the earliest times, and legend has it that the first defense work of importance was erected in 916 AD by Ethelfreda, the daughter of Alfred the Great. In the 14th century, the earldom of Warwick came to the Beecham family. They built the two great towers, Caesars and Guy's, justly described as masterpieces of 14th century military architecture. The Great Hall houses arms and armor from the earliest times. These were hand forged from sheet iron and richly embellished with precious metals to be displayed at military parades and at the colorful tournaments of that chivalrous age. In 1509, there came to the English throne a king who was to change the course of English history, Henry VIII. His reformation released the church from the stranglehold of the Vatican. Upon his death, Edward VI was crowned king, only to reign for six years. His half-sister, Queen Mary, died in 1558 to make way for one of England's greatest queens, Elizabeth I. Hers was an age of new discovery, a mixture of humor, intrigue, courtliness, immortalized by such writers as Shakespeare and Bacon. In the early 17th century, a new monarch, Charles I, with his wife Henrietta and his nephew, Prince Rupert, were to instigate a new way of life in England by leading the country into total civil war. This era of flamboyance has been reborn in the 20th century by a large number of enthusiasts who call themselves the Sealed Knot Society. These present-day cavaliers are drawn from all walks of life, and commanding these dedicated enthusiasts is a much decorated hero of the Second World War. 
It is the formidable task of the Brigadier's army to recreate the attack on Warwick Castle, an onslaught that occurred in August 1642 during the uncivil English Civil War. To accomplish this historical feat, they had to research the period thoroughly and go through rigorous training as the weapons of the 17th century could be fatal in the hands of the unprepared. March on! Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves either as or not. In 17th century battles, using a horse, um, there's you know, various difficulties in actual fact, and they vary from battle to battle. With using horses in, in these 17th century battles with all the explosions, etc., you find that even when you use, use the same horses, you can use them one day and use the same horses the following day, they often react completely differently. One day they're full of fire and the next day they're quiet, and often vice versa. You know. Often one will be excited and bolt, and the others, because they follow, they go after them. This is another thing. When you, when you practice a thing, you try to get position right in knee to knee, etc., they react to this, and all your formation is broken up. The nimble gunner with match the devilish cannon touches. Down goes all the time. One of the main dangers with black powder is to actually keep the stuff out of contact with the general public and of idiots who walk around smoking and messing about with the stuff. As long as safety precautions are taken, it's perfectly usable and safe to handle. But if you get any anybody fooling around with the stuff, it becomes a, a lethal bit of powder. We use quite a bit of it, and therefore the main part of having a the correct 17th century drill is that safety precautions are actually built into the drill because with pound or a pound and a half black powder in one of these things anybody messing about at the muzzle end is liable to lose a couple of hands if the thing goes off accidentally so we do the drill as authentically and as correctly as possible have a cap fire piece <laughs> To enrank his men, he had no time. So splintered pike he set before his foe. Like hedgehog, bristling in a fiery wind that challenged horse to go. The pike is a weapon of a large formation of foot soldiers. And because the 16-foot pike is so clumsy, it's ineffective as an individual weapon. The men must be constantly trained to overcome this inherent clumsiness. And they're also trained to be able to carry out the moves as a close packed unit. We also carry out these moves in unison so that each man considers himself to be a part of that unit and not an ineffective individual. Your fight! You'll learn. Fight your front! Oh, you leaden messengers that ride the steeds of fire, or come the scything sword and pike, and dispatch them to their funeral pile. When new members come along to the sealed nuts and express a desire to be a musketeer, um, they obtain by their own musket from different sources, uh, and they come along with the musket and we check it out for the mechanics and um, that it's in proof. This is for safety reasons, because it would be silly to have someone come along on the battlefield and fire any old sort of uh, weapon. Now we uh, take the recruit to one side separately so that he's out of danger of other people and he's fully trained in the use of loading and the safety aspect. I'm now ready to fire. This ice-cold blade of death that arcs the air and strikes at life. This sword, this edge, that cuts so many from their worldly strife. The sword is a classic weapon of single combat. It's the weapon to which 
much mystique is attached. One man fighting one man. Where we've got large bodies of men, the use of the blade is really restricted to hacking and slashing at any, anything that's available, slashing at the horse's flanks. We restrict the use of the sword in the battles for reasons of safety. One obviously couldn't have a chap rushing across and accosting someone else that he's never met before and laying about him with a sword. So we practice and we try and get people that do these workouts together and they practice quite a lot until they can get a good fight sequence going. Well, I never thought it was going to be like this. Raiment of iron and leather, stand up to battle's fury. So if I enter death's dark door, I am bedecked in all my glory. When we started making uniforms, we had a, an awful lot of trouble um, in as much as that you can go into any art gallery throughout the world and see beautiful costumes of the day um, painted by contemporary artists, but they all show the upper classes and what we wanted to get was the everyday chap in the street, um, the gunner, the pipeman. We wanted his, what he wore. So we had to go into broadsheets, we had to go into woodcuts. Unfortunately, woodcuts don't show as much detail. Um, we had to blow these up and really get into the pictures and cut our patterns off these. Detail, going into this sort of detail, it costs a lot of money. Um, half of the, the film set, half of the uniforms and costumes used in films wouldn't just, just wouldn't stand up to see or not wear. It's so tough. This brings a lot of cost into it, of course. Our plot has to be good. And let's face it, on a battle with a thousand chaps on the field, it can come to quite a lot of money. In some cases, near £200,000 worth of goods are on the field in weapons, in costumes. Yes, you can see um, the colours of the costumes are very bright, um, the blues, the reds, and what have you. It took us quite, quite some time to get the, the colour right. Lots of people say they wore all sorts of dull clarets and plum colours, russets and everything. But a lot of this was Victorian artists' ideas of the colours of the day. You, you, you have a look at some paintings, you'll find some incredible colours. A lovely expression for the 17th century is that the 17th century was an age of leather and lace. And it's very, very true. And this is something in our everyday life, our drab world of today, that's gone forever. The focal point of the first stage of the battle will be Ethelfrida's Mound, right here. Careful planning is necessary to stage a battle the size of Warwick. Peter Morton, master gunner and commander of the train of artillery, discusses with some of his regiment the final plans for the battle. The first stage of the battle will be a forlorn hope which will cross the River Avon at about this point and attempt to form a bridgehead on the banks. When this bridgehead has been successfully formed, the main army will move out of the woods and along this road here and attempt to link up with them. Where would you like the musketeers placing? How many men have you got, Malcolm? Well, we have two muskets away at the proof house at the moment, but on the day we should have about 24. Well, I should put them down with the main body of attackers at the beginning of the battle, and then bring them up with a train of artillery when it moves up along the road here. OK. What about the opposition, Pete? What about the parliamentarian army? Whereabouts in the castle will they be? Well, there's no point in using any part of the castle that the audience can't see. So we shall go from about Guy's Tower here, right the way down to Ethelfrida's Mound. While I think of it, what we must remember is that the command post where everything is controlled is here. I'm Ethelfrida's Mound. That's it.
the dull beat of drums caused me to believe that this day will be unlike any other. It has been rumoured that a royalist army was gathering and on the move. Knowing this, I must raise the alarm. Call out the guard! Prepare to stun! Stun! The Royalist Army have drawn up its forces within two miles of the castle. My commander, a staunch parliamentarian, has given the order for our troops to engage the Royalists in open country. Compared to our high-spirited and untried troops, the royalist ranks seem calm and resolute. Yea, Lord, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no ill, for thou art with me, thy rod and staff comforteth me. Give fire! The Royalists have attacked. The battle for Warwick has begun. Open fire!
losing the advantage of the field. Our reserve troops are being committed to reinforce our weakening position. The army has been pushed back. The castle is now in range of royalist cannon. Close to the castle, I can see a group of gunners employing carriage wheels as a windlass to remount a weighty cannon barrel. The battle for the field is lost. Our troops have been ordered to retreat. Thank <laughs> you. 
Our position is one of strength. These walls will hold against the enemy batteries. They can only place us under siege and hope to starve us into submission. But we are well provisioned. Under the flag of truce, we are given quarter to collect our dead and wounded from the field of battle. Deputation approaches the castle. In the name of my sovereign, I demand parley with your governor. They have come to demand its surrender. I have needlessly lost good men. I demand an immediate surrender. I'm speaking from a position of strength. As you Their demand was denied. The Royalists retire, only to attack again under the cover of darkness. After many days of siege, these ancient ramparts withstood the onslaught of battle, and Warwick Castle remained in Parliament's hands for the rest of the English Civil War. Today, Warwick Castle is one of Great Britain's biggest tourist attractions for people the world over. Its compelling magic, charm and grandeur stems from its prominent role in England's rich and turbulent history. A history without Warwick Castle would be a history consigned to literature and the imagination. So, long may Warwick Castle stand the ravages of time to be a poignant and splendid reminder of England's royal and glorious past. Oh!